All right, we're going to look now at using transformations with rational functions and turning towards functions that have a little bit more to them than just those basic rational functions. What we're going to do is look at how we can connect what we know about the basic rational functions already and what we know about transformations and then move into graphing things that look more like that in that format with more parameters involved. Before we get into some specific uh, examples, uh, we're going to look at this function in general, dynamically here, by uh, having this function in here with those three parameters, a, h, and k, uh, set in here as sliders. And then when we adjust those, we can change the, the shape of the graph. So what we have here is this basic rational function, the mo kind of the most basic one. You can have 1 over x, right? Because right now I have it set as a is 1, h is 0, k is 0. So that just gives you that graph you expect, those two branches, horizontal asymptote along the uh, x-axis here and vertical asymptote along the y-axis, passes through that point 1, 1, 2, a half, you know, 4, a quarter, etc. that you've seen before. Now we'll adjust these things one at a time. We've already seen what happens when you adjust that a value because we've looked at y equals a over x. As you adjust that a value, you get the shape of the thing changes, right? It gets, it's, it's an expansion. Or it could be a compression if you were to actually make that smaller than one, if you wanted to, it'd be tighter in towards the axis there. And actually, if you made it negative, it would end up being a reflection. Those two branches would be over there. We'll look at how we can make some sense of that with transformations a little bit more later. But for now, let's stick to what we already know. When you have that six there, it's gonna pass through this point, six, one, 3, 2, 2, 3, 1, 6, and then the corresponding points on the other side here. All those pairs of values that multiply to 6. We've seen that before. Now let's get rid of those points before we do anything else. And let's put this back to 1 before. It's probably a little bit easier to follow. We leave it as a 1. There we go. Now the other two things, uh, you might not be sure about what they do, but you've seen this before. If you take a function that looks like that, if that's your base function you're starting with, and you replace x with x minus h. You've seen before, if you've had any kind of study of transformations, that that's just going to shift the thing horizontally. It's a horizontal translation. If you make that a positive 5, right? if you have y equals 1 over x minus 5, well, the entire graph, what you would have had with this, is shifted 5 to the right. So what that means in terms of this specific function is the vertical asymptote is now not along the y-axis, not at x equals 0. It's now at x equals 5. Because now 5 is the non-permissible value. And that makes sense in the equation because when you look at this equation, it, the non-permissible value, the value of x that is not part of the domain is 5. Right? Because you can't have 1 divided by 0 here. It's undefined. So shifting that thing side to side there corresponds with that denominator of the fraction in that rational expression here. Say if we make it negative 4, well it shifts it 4 to the left. The asymptote is at x equals negative 4 because negative 4 is the non-permissible value. Alright, now as for the k value, first let's put this h back to 0 there. As for the k value, if you change this k value, it's not going to be a horizontal translation, it's going to be a vertical translation. Adding or subtracting a number onto the end of a function just shifts it up or down, right? Because you're making every y value, you're adding, say, if I leave it at 3 there, whatever you would have had before, okay, whatever this value of this thing is 1 over x, now it's going to be 3 greater than that. It's going to tack on 3, right? Add on 3 there. What that does graphically here is it moves that horizontal asymptote up 3. Okay, it used to be the x-axis, y equals 0. Now it's going to be y equals 3. All right? This thing's going to level off at 3 either way here. The end behavior of the thing. All right, you talk about the end behavior. What happens as x gets really large, positive or negative? What happens as the absolute value of x gets very large? As the absolute value of x gets really large here, this term, 1 over x, becomes closer and closer to 0 and then you're left with just the 3. The larger you make x here, either positive or negative, the more that this term 0, and that levels off at 3. All right? So try and connect the graph with what you see happening in the equation there. You can combine all these different things together, 
and have several different transformations. You can have those two, translations to the right and up. And then you can actually have one of these as well, right? Now, let's say if we had this as a, a two, let's leave it as a two there, right? A two, two is gonna mean that um, it's gonna have those uh, points that we're familiar with, except they're all gonna be translated to the right and up. I'm gonna put a couple lines in here. You can see what's happening here. I'm gonna put a line that shows where those two asymptotes are. I'm going to put in y equals 3 because that's that horizontal asymptote and I'm going to put in x equals 4 x equals 4 because that's the vertical asymptote. Now you can see that the, when you have this thing as a 2 it's going to be related to where those two asymptotes are the same way it was say for this function when it was in the center to the axes. So as a, as a way of kind of making sense of the graph here you can almost just imagine you know, those are the axes, and you kind of ignore those shifts, and then you can see this relationship of, you know, this 2 over x before the shifts. Uh, 2 over x means you're going to have pairs of numbers that multiply to 2, and that's what you have here, right? You have, from this point right here, you have these points, right? 2, 1, 1, 2, those are those points that correspond to the center before. And the same thing here, negative 2, negative 1, right? That, that, or, or uh, negative 1, negative 2, that point there. So that's a kind of an initial look at this. And uh, we're going to turn now to working with sp some specific examples and see if we can take the equation, generate the graph, and then the other way around as well. Take the graph and write the equation for it. Okay, let's do that now. All right, so we're going to look at a specific example here, and we are going to try to create the graph of this function uh, using what we understand about transformations and then analyze it a little bit afterwards. So we have three parameters there. We're, uh, we're looking at 8 over x as the base function, right? So we're going to try and relate it to this simpler function, y equals 8 over x, after looking at these translations here. So what we have here is two translations. We have a horizontal translation of 3 to the left. And we have this minus 1 here is a vertical translation of 1 down. So if we're trying to graph this, what we can do is just deal with that first by imagining that our asymptotes and everything about the graph has shifted. So the simplest thing to do is draw two lines to represent the shifted axes and then use those as a reference for drawing a few points so that you can create the curve. And since the asymptotes are not actually part of the graph, we'll draw them in a different color. So that's our vertical asymptote, three to the left, and then we've gone one down here. Horizontal asymptote there. Now you're just going to use this as a guide to draw the graph. It's not part of the graph, so use a different color or dotted line or something. Now that I've drawn those pink lines, dealt with these translations, I can imagine that that's the function I'm graphing using those pink lines. All right? And I can just think again what we've done before, which is if it's y equals 8 over x, just think instead of x, y equals 8, we're going to just think of pairs of numbers that multiply to 8 and use those pink axes. So a point on uh, on 8 over x would be 2, 4. So I'm going to go 2, 4 like this. Put a dot there. Uh, it would be 4, 2 as well. So I'm going to go 4, 2 from there. And continue that along. 8, 1. So that's going to give me 8 and 1. And uh, whoops, let's get rid of that. And then 1, 8 would be over here. That's going to be 1, 8. And you could continue on. If you had more space, you could do, you know, 16 and a half, a half, 16, but that's going to be good enough. And then if I just draw the corresponding points on the other side here, and there we go. And then just try to draw the curve for that. If I connect these points nicely, somewhat nicely, this is not great, but it's probably going to serve well enough. And then the other side here, Draw that curve to connect all those points. Just using the points as a guide, obviously. And then just try and make sure that you have the ends of the curve always getting closer to those asymptotes. All right. So there's the graph of that 
of that function. Now for the domain and the range, the domain has to do with that denominator there. X cannot be negative 3, so I'm going to write X is a real number such that X is not equal to negative 3. Key part of that is, depending, you know, if you want to write in set notation like that, you can, but that's the key part of it, right? X is not equal to 3. If you want to write the range now, the range, Y, it's a real number, but Y cannot be negative 1, right? Because negative 1 we can never get. This thing is going to get closer and closer to 0 as the absolute value of X gets larger. As you make X big positive number or way out to the left negative number, this thing's going to approach zero, but it's never going to quite get to zero. There's no way to make that fraction actually equal to zero, so there's no way to make this entire value negative one. If this thing can never be zero, just gets closer and closer, the whole thing can never get to be negative one. So y is not equal to negative one, even though it gets infinitely close. All right, now the last thing that I have here is this end behavior. End behavior has to do with what we were just talking about, looking at this uh, behavior as you, you know, this horizontal asymptote here, the behavior as you go to the end to the right or the left. If we're going to describe the end behavior here, remember, end behavior is what happens as you go right and left. In other words, as absolute value of x gets really large. So as the absolute value of x gets very large, y approaches negative 1. Gets infinitely close to negative 1. Now, so that's the function's end behavior. It behavior near the non-permissible value, so as x gets closer to negative 3, as x approaches negative 3, y gets really big or really uh, negative. So the way to say that is the absolute value of y gets very large. Absolute value of y gets very large. Absolute value of y approaches infinity, if you want to say that. All right, so there's using some transformations to create the graph and analyze that function. We're going to move on to doing the reverse now, being given the graph and then writing the equation from that. So in this example, we're given a graph, and we're asked to find the equation in this form. We're told it's in that form. We're going to look at this two ways here. One is we're going to use the pattern in the points that we know from those basic rational functions to come up with that a value. And then the other is we're going to substitute the coordinates of a point to find that a value. The first thing we need to do in either case, though, is come up with the h and the k parameters here. That and that. And we're going to do that by looking at the asymptotes where they are. So I'm going to draw them in here just so we can see it better. And the horizontal one. So from those two asymptotes you can tell the horizontal and vertical shift. It's been shifted one to the right and two up. So horizontal translation of one to the right and a vertical translation of 2 up. And so we can use that to come up with those h and k values. We can start writing it here. I'll give myself some space first. So we can write it as y equals, we'll leave this as an a for now because we haven't figured that out yet, x minus 1 because we're 1 to the right and plus 2 because we're 2 up. Now as far as finding that a value, first method use the pattern in the points. If you look at this here, uh, if we identify some points on the graph that pass through where we can read the coordinates, say there's one, there's one, looks like it passes through a grid point, that one, integer values. If you look at that, uh, this right here looks like it's 5 to the right and 1 down, right? Or 1 to the right and 5 down. So we've got 5, negative 1, or, or 1, negative 5. 5, negative 1, 1, negative 5. Those things look like they multiply to negative 5. Same thing on the other side here, right? If you go the other way here, negative 1, 5, or negative 5, 1. All of those pairs of numbers multiply to negative 5. So you can use that to say that that a value is negative 5. 
So if I go down here and write it with my a value in there, method one using that pattern in the points to come up with the fact that this is negative five. All three parameters make sense here. The one and the two represent these two translations. And then we've got the expansion that the five gives us. And then we've got this reflection. Whether you're looking at it horizontally or vertically, it doesn't matter. Because without that negative, those two curves would be here and here, roughly drawing them, not passing to the points properly, but be there and there. Since there's that negative, there's the reflection. All right? Now, if we wanted to come up with that, if we, if we didn't notice the pattern in the points there to give us the negative 5, what we could do is just start with this. I'll write it over here. To find that a value, what you can do is take the coordinates of a single point, say that one. Now, not looking at it as in relation to our asymptotes, but just the actual coordinates of that point. The coordinates of this point here are 6, 1. If you substitute in those values here, one over here and a 6 on the bottom here, and we put the rest of it in, and just leave A, right? If you have any equation and you can fill in all the values except for 1, right, this 1 here, we can solve for that thing now. We've got 1 equals A over 5, right, because 6 minus 1 on the bottom there, 5. We have this, if we take our 2 over here, we got negative 1 is A over 5. So that is going to give us that A is negative 5. So there's our A value that way, right? And then we can just write it in there, get that same equation either way. All right, so there's two different ways to come up with that equation from the graph. Now, before we're finished here, probably a good idea to summarize some of the information here. Lots of information. We've looked at functions that are of that form y equals a over x minus h plus k and how they're related by transformations to those basic rational functions and it's useful in creating graphs and writing equations making that connection the domain and the range are related to that h value and that k value that horizontal and vertical shift the equations of the asymptotes same thing related to that h value and that k value x equals h, that h value is a non-permissible value because it's in the denominator of that rational expression. And then as far as uh, behavior near non-permissible value, as you get closer to that h value, the absolute value of y gets really, really large. And then the end behavior, as absolute value of x gets really large, y value approaches that k, whatever that k value is. And then lastly here, uh, when you're sketching the graphs, uh, it's a good idea to draw the horizontal and vertical asymptotes, you know, dotted lines or something first, and use them as a guide to draw the graph, and then uh, use the idea of pairs of numbers that multiply to that a value. All right, that's it. That's using transformations with uh, rational functions.